Welcome into today's Just the Truth. Glad to have you join me in the PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition Studio. To lose weight for the last time, visit myphdweightloss.com. Breaking news, the Republican-led House of Representatives in an afternoon vote yesterday failed to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the crisis at the southern border, marking a major blow for House Republicans who have pushed for Mayorkas' removal. We got the full details for you here today. Also, a group of Senate Republicans is growing weary of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's leadership and have called for him to step down as they aired their grievances over what they called a, quote, dead bipartisan border bill slated for the first floor procedural vote today. And while we're talking about GOP leadership, or some would say failed GOP leadership, RNC Chair Rona McDaniel is said to be stepping down after this month's primary in South Carolina. Yesterday, the people of Nevada voted in their primaries. Both the Democrats and Republicans had primary elections. The Democrats was pretty straightforward, but on the GOP side, things were a bit complicated. I'll give you the details on what's happening in Nevada as well. And in South Carolina, judicial elections are at a gridlock as calls for much-needed judicial reform delays the election process of judges in the South Carolina General Assembly. Your comments are welcome on the Furman Ford text line, 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. You can leave a quick voice message, and your emails are welcome. Joey at joeyhudson.com. I told you we'd be back. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's Joey Hudson. Your story Mm -hmm. was powerful when you delivered it up at the General Assembly. People are still talking about your story. The CON has gone away in the state of South Carolina, and I want to personally thank you. I wanted to name it the Joey Hudson Bill, but, you know, they don't allow you to name put names on bills, (laughs) but I wanted to call it the Joey Hudson Bill because I I know that one's been near and dear to you for a number of years. That's how it's done. Let your voice be heard. And the truth shall set you free. Here's Joey Hudson. Let's start with the Republican-led House of Representatives yesterday failing to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the southern border. This was a major blow. No, No other way to look at it. As House Republicans who have a a slim majority, but a majority, were not able to to get a positive vote on Mayorkas' removal. The House voted mostly along party lines, but Republicans suffered a number of defections, which uh, basically torpedoed the vote. Democrats remained united. The vote was 214 to 216, two votes difference. The vote was on two articles of impeachment that accused Secretary Mayorkas of having refused to comply with federal immigration laws and the other having violated public trust. A cabinet secretary has not been impeached since 1876 when Secretary of War William Belknap was impeached then. Republicans accused Mayorkas of disregarding federal law with open border policies that have made the ongoing crisis at our southern border much worse. They pointed to the rolling back of Trump-era policies like the border wall construction, the remain in Mexico, as well as reducing interior enforcement and expanding the catch and release program. They say it has fueled record numbers at the southern border, where numbers breached the 300,000 mark in December. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has defended how he's handled the border crisis. Representative Corey Mills, a Republican from Florida, called the vote a slap in the face to the American people. Hey everyone, Congressman Corey Mills, Florida 7th District. Today, as we all saw, the defeat on the floor was a slap in the face to the American people to get accountability for Secretary Mayorkas, who has not only lied before Congress, but has cherry-picked his constitutional duties in which he'll uphold or not uphold by keeping us as a sovereign nation. This was not going to be the only fight, and we will make sure that accountability comes back to the floor. A motion has already been made to recommit, which has passed, and we will try and bring this back to the floor. But let us acknowledge one thing, that Joe Biden, if he wanted to right now, can secure the border through his unilateral executive authority under 212 Section F, that we should be enabling our CBP and ICE to do their job to crack down the borders and to stop the unlawful entry. We have to go forward with pushing the Senate 
to take up HR2, which is the most robust and conservative border bill that we've ever had. Very different in a stark contrast to the amnesty bill that Schumer, Lankford, and McConnell are trying to push. Tonight, you're just as disappointed as I am when it comes to these failures, but we will not stop fighting. I will vote yes, I will continue to support to get accountability, and we will guarantee that our borders get secured. Thank you, appreciate the support, God bless. Homeland Security Committee Chairman Mark Green said on the House floor, under Secretary Morcus's watch, Customs and Border Protection has reported more than 8.5 million encounters at the border, including more than 7 million apprehensions at the southwest border. Even more terrifying is the approximately 1.8 million known gotaways that Border Patrol agents detect but are unable to apprehend. Millions of those inadmissible aliens or who are encountered are eventually released into our communities, he said. This has never happened before in our history, and it doesn't happen by accident. Green said that Republicans had been left with no other option than to proceed. Democrats in the administration have painted the impeachment process as politically motivated on nothing more than policy disagreements and nothing that approaches high crimes and misdemeanors, which are requirements for impeachment. It's, it's, it's been known that even with the House voting to impeach, a Senate uh, conviction is unlikely. Uh, Representative Pramila Jayapal, the Democrat from Washington, said far from alleging high crimes and misdemeanors, this resolution relies on the same tired and untrue Republican talking points that Democrats have demonstrated for months that are not true. Homeland Security Committee Ranking Member Benny Thompson called the push a travesty and an affront to the Constitution. Mayorkas himself had attacked the push against him, calling the allegations false and baseless. Mayorker said, I assure you that your false accusations do not rattle me and do not divert me from the law enforcement and broader public service mission to which I've devoted most of my career and to which I remain devoted. How does he explain? How does he, he believe that he's done his job when our country is under siege by illegals? DHS has pointed out uh, in defense of Mayorkas, saying that there's been more than 500,000 removals since May and record seizures of fentanyl at the border. The counteract claims that it's pursued open border policies. It's also called on Republicans to provide more funding and to work with the administration to, quote, fix a broken immigration system. We've heard Joe Biden and other members of his administration repeatedly talk about the broken immigration system. A DHS official said in a recent memo, this farce of an impeachment is a distraction from other vital national security priorities and the work Congress should be doing to actually fix our broken immigration laws. Meanwhile, over in the Senate, a group of Senate Republicans is growing quite uh, weary of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's leadership and have called for him to step down as they air their grievances over what they called a, quote, dead bipartisan border bill that was slated for first-floor procedural votes today. Senators J.D. Vance of Ohio, Ted Cruz of Texas, told reporters yesterday in a press conference that McConnell should have walked away from the border agreement, which they argue expands President Biden's power and does not fully close the border. We'll start with Senator Vance, one of Congress's loudest critics against Ukraine assistance, saying, we supported a negotiation to bring common sense border security to this country. We did not agree to a border fig leaf to send another $61 billion to Ukraine. Senator Cruz, who has been a staunch critic of McConnell since 2013, said that the longstanding leader offered no response when he asked him, is there anything that we're willing to fight on regarding the closed-door border negotiations that began back in December, which Republicans are now determined to tarnish? Cruz said, everyone here has supported a leadership challenge to Mitch McConnell in November. I think a Republican leader should actually lead this conference and should advance the priorities of Republicans. Following the GOP luncheon on Tuesday, McConnell told reporters, I think we all agree that Senator Cruz is not a fan. Senator James Langford of Oklahoma, the lead Republican negotiation, uh, negotiator 
has been facing pushback from the caucus over the deal that was struck and was announced on Sunday. Uh, the, the other senators involved, Senator Chris Murphy and Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and other Biden administration officials. More than 20 Republicans have already vowed to strike down the bill on Wednesday today, arguing that they need adequate time for amendments and further analysis. Meanwhile, Republicans are also hanging on to a post that uh, Murphy posted on X Sunday after the text of the bill was released. It read, the border never closes, but claims must be processed at the ports. Senator Cruz contended the Biden administration already has the ability to shut down the border and turn migrants away under the current immigration laws. Every once in a while, we have some good news. The good news is this bill is dead. Now, my views on this bill have not been ambiguous. At the last press conference we had here, I described it as, quote, a steaming pile of crap. Some people afterwards criticized that characterization. Can't imagine why. And they said, well, you haven't read the text, so how can you say that? And you're right. All I knew was what had been described by the bill sponsors. Well, now we've seen the text, and it turned out my assessment was far too kind. This bill is a terrible bill. I'm going to break it down on two two metrics, number one, policy, and number two, politics. On policy, why is this bill a terrible bill? Because it does not solve the problem. We have the worst rate of illegal immigration in our nation's history. People are dying. Children are being brutalized. Women are being sexually assaulted. Over 100,000 people died of overdoses last year. This bill doesn't fix it. Understand, this border crisis is deliberate. Joe Biden caused it. He caused it by his own unilateral decisions. Three decisions caused this crisis, all made the first week of his presidency. He inherited the lowest rate of illegal immigration in 45 years, and his first week as president, he halted construction on the border wall, he reinstated the disastrous policy of catch and release, and he pulled out of the unbelievably successful remain in Mexico agreement. That caused this explosion. It also means Joe Biden could solve it tomorrow. How would he solve it tomorrow? By reversing those three decisions, and you would get once again a secure border. Joe Biden doesn't want to secure the border. Kamala Harris doesn't want to secure the border. Chuck Schumer doesn't want to secure the border. And this bill was designed not to secure the border. Senator Cruz is right, isn't he? Uh, He said the only way the border bill will make it across the finish line in the national supplemental package is if the Senate passed H.R. 2, the GOP-led House's immigration bill that was passed last year, which includes the Trump-era-style expulsions and security measures. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has already deemed the bill a non-starter in the Senate. Meanwhile, the House has repeatedly called the Senate's border bill dead on arrival making it uh, nearly an impossible scenario that any type of border bill will be passed. Uh, also today, the a, a separate vote on support for Israel failed. It seems that the only thing the, the, the Biden administration is really serious about is the $60 billion they want for Ukraine. Senator Rick Scott, uh, who was an unsuccessful contender against McConnell in last uh, in the last election for the majority leader or, or, or the GOP leader in the Senate, said a few people negotiated the border when it should have been open to the entire GOP conference to offer amendments. McConnell decided we're not going to have something that forced a lawless administration to secure the border, and so this is where we are, he said. Senator Ron Johnson, another no vote told reporters that McConnell was fatally flawed when he entered into this secret negotiation with Senator Schumer. Johnson said it normalizes thousands of people a day. It probably undermines the future president's ability to secure the border by having things like a discretionary threshold. And Senator Vance added that Langford was at a disadvantage in the negotiations because the White House has more lawyers compared to the Republican senator's team. Vance said, so on the one hand, 
You have the Democrat majority. You have the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, and you have the army of lawyers that they all have. And on the other hand is James Langford, his staff negotiating in secret. The idea that any person could negotiate successfully through a border security package that would not have multiple loopholes in it is crazy. These guys have a massive advantage. It was a huge mistake, he said. Other Republicans during yesterday's news conference, including Senators Roger Marshall of Kansas and Mike Lee of Utah, also spoke out against the bill, saying that uh, it has a whole lot of loopholes. Loopholes through which you could drive a Mack truck, a 747, and an Airbus A380 simultaneously through them, and that's concerning, Senator Lee said. Marshall defended Langford and said not even Henry Kissinger could have negotiated a better deal with the cards that he was dealt. The proposed legislation that we learned about on Sunday, after these months of negotiations, months of wa- uh, that were we now know were wasted, totals uh, just over $118 billion. It includes 50,000 new visas. Biden's original request amounted to $106 billion. Yesterday, Joe Biden said the border package doesn't address everything that he would have liked, such as creating a pathway for citizenship for the illegals who've already uh, crossed our border illegally. He said uh, he, he called it the toughest, fairest law that has ever been proposed relative to the border, though. Biden, in a statement, said, I'm calling on Congress to pass this bill, get it to my desk immediately. But if the bill fails every day between now and November, the American people are going to know that the only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. So there he goes again, blaming the so-called MAGA Republicans, you and me, on our border situation when everybody in the world knows Joe Biden is the blame. Just as Senator Cruz very eloquently explained earlier, we he had one of the most secure borders we've had in recent history when he walked into the Oval Office and with the stroke of a pen reversed every bit of that. During negotiations, President Trump urged senators on his platform, True Social, to reject a deal, saying unless we get everything needed to shut down the invasion of millions and millions of people, Republicans are, conceal, uh, are concerned that the bill does not flatly reduce the number of border crossings to zero. The bill's provision comes into effect when there's an average of 5,000 or more daily encounters with illegal immigrants over a seven-day period, or alternately when a combined total of 8,500 or more aliens are encountered on a single day. So, so, so we're basically conceding that 5,000 can come in every day. I mean, I mean, who's going to sit there and count them? And why would we even allow a single illegal to come into our country? The bill would earmark $20 billion to immigration enforcement. It includes the hiring of thousands of new officers to evaluate the asylum claims, as well as hundreds of Border Patrol agents. Some of the taxpayer funds would go to bailing out shelters and services in cities across the U.S. that have struggled to keep up because of the influx of the illegals. The bill states that if the president finds that it is in the national interest to temporarily suspend the Border Emergency Authority, the president may direct the secretary to suspend use of the Border Emergency Authority on an emergency basis. The border emergency, triggered at 5,000 crossings per day within a week, could be overturned by the president. 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Your comments are welcome on the Furman Ford text line. Have you ever seen anything that is just so maddening than the fact that we're having this conversation about allowing people into our country illegally. And and when I see Joe Biden stand there and he literally gets red in the face sometimes because he claims that we have a secure border or that it's the MAGA Republicans fault, my blood boils every time he, every time he says that it's the MAGA Republicans fault. 
and this is the this is the man who just over the weekend supposedly had a conversation with a dead France uh, president of France who died 30 years ago. And the Democrats want us to blindly follow him. The Democrats expect us to, to think that he actually knows what he's talking about. More on that in just a minute as well. Uh, interesting exchange yesterday between Corinne Jean-Pierre and Fox News' Peter Ducey. Speaking of GOP leadership, Republican National Committee Chair Ronald McDaniel plans to step down after the South Carolina primary this month and has given notice to former President Trump, according to numerous reports. The New York Times reported that people familiar with her plan say that Trump will likely move Michael Whatley, the chair of the North Carolina Republican Party, into McDaniel's position. Love to hear from some of my some of my friends in North Carolina. What do you think about Michael Watley? You know, I don't really know him. Love to hear from some of you in North Carolina of what you think about your Republican Party chairman there and the idea of him taking over the RNC. Text me your comments to the Furman Four text line, 864-477-5639. Is Michael Watley, uh, w- would he make a good RNC chairman? Republican National Convention spokesperson Keith Shipper told the media, nothing has changed. This will be decided after South Carolina. The former president, we're told, met with McDaniel at Mar-a-Lago in uh, Palm Beach on Monday. Trump wrote in his Truth Social platform following the meeting that McDaniel was, quote, a friend, but that he would be urging changes at the RNC after the February 24th South Carolina GOP presidential primary, which, of course, is the next major contest in the Republican 2024 nominating calendar. Uh, um, Trump wrote, Rona is now head of the RNC, and I'll be making the decision the day after the South Carolina primary as to my recommendations for RNC growth. Speaking of the primaries, yesterday the people in Nevada voted in their primaries. Both the Democrats and Republicans had primary elections. The Democrats was pretty straightforward. The GOP side? Uh, things were a little bit complicated. Were you a little confused about the idea that Nevada had a GOP primary, but yet on Thursday, tomorrow, they're going to have caucuses? Does that confuse you? I'll explain all of it in details in just a moment. Are you ready to lose that excess weight? Is 2024 the year that you have committed yourself to getting healthy? and losing the weight maybe that you put on over the last few years? I got the solution for you. PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. Boy, am I glad I made that call over three years ago now to Dr. Ashley Lucas. Let me encourage you to make the call today as well. 864-252-4925. Tell them I sent you and set up that initial consultation and see if this program is right for you as well. I lost 30 pounds pretty quickly, and I've been able to keep it off over three years now. This is not a diet. It's not a fad diet. Dr. Ashley Lucas developed the PhD weight loss and nutrition program based on the science of nutrition, what to eat, when to eat, and how to eat. It'll change your relationship with food. I promise you. It wasn't really that difficult once I got into it. And after I lost the weight, they have a wonderful lifetime maintenance program. They're with you for the rest of your life. You're not going to lose the weight and then you're on your own. They have a great maintenance program as well. Let me encourage you to start your journey today. And within a few weeks, you too can say that you've lost 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds or more. Call and set up your initial consultation. 864-252-4925 online at myphdweightloss.com. PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition, the official partner of the Clemson Tigers. The people of Nevada cast their ballots yesterday as the key early voting state in the race for the White House held both Democrat and Republican presidential primaries. Now, I have to say, this was a bit confusing. I actually was confused about it. My sweet wife, Peg, kind of uh, <laughs> kind of straightened me out on it because I was focused on the caucuses, 
which are coming up tomorrow, Thursday. And Peg was saying, well, you know, they're voting in primaries on Tuesday. So, so, so what's up here? Well, uh, as I dug into it a little bit, and hey, maybe you already knew this, uh, but it is rather confusing. Uh, Democrats held their contest, and it was pretty straightforward. President Joe Biden, pretty much uh, the the only contestant on the Democrat side. There was only one of the of the two major contenders in the GOP on the ballot yesterday, Nikki Haley. Trump, who is the commanding front runner in the GOP nomination, wasn't on the ballot yesterday. Instead, Trump will be listed in a presidential caucus. That's being held tomorrow in Nevada. So the confusion over having two competing contests actually goes back to 2021. Let me give you a little bit of history here. Democrats, who at the time controlled both Nevada's governor's office and the legislature, passed a law changing the presidential nominating contest from the long-held caucuses to a state-run primary. The Nevada GOP objected. But last year, their legal bid to stop the primary from going forward was rejected. But in a twist, the judge over the case allowed the state Republicans to also hold their caucuses. So no delegates were at stake in the Republican primary. So Nikki Haley's win means nothing. Because all 26 delegates will be up for grabs tomorrow in the GOP caucus, which Trump will win since Haley's not participating. Are you following this? (laughs) Is that confusing enough for you? The state GOP ruled that candidates who put their name on the state-run primary ballot could not take part in the caucuses. Haley and some of the uh, other now-departed Republican presidential candidates viewed the Nevada GOP as too loyal to Trump and decided to skip the caucus that they believed was tipped in favor of the former president. Nevada GOP Chair Michael McDonald and both of the state members of the Republican National Committee are Trump supporters. Haley campaign manager Betsy uh, Ankney argued on uh, Monday, we made the decision early on that we were not going to pay $55,000 to a Trump entity that, you know, to participate in a process that was rigged for Trump. So they, Haley decided not to participate in the caucuses and to concede those delegates. Trump assured, uh, is assured of winning the 26 delegates at stake. Sources say that he and his campaign advisors uh, do have some concerns. An unpleasant potential scenario for Trump, who won both the Iowa caucuses and New Hampshire primary by double, du- double digits, could be that Haley grabs more votes in the primary than Trump gets in the caucus. But who cares? <laughs> I mean, he's still going to get the 26 delegates, which is what counts towards the nomination. The GOP presidential candidates had to choose either the caucus or the primary. You can't do both. Trump's campaign has been working to get the message out to supporters in Nevada that if they want to vote for the former president, they need to show up at the caucuses. But he also wanted them to vote in the primaries, because you did have that option, but not to vote for Nikki Haley. He encouraged voters to go to the caucus meetings this Thursday. He said, your primary vote doesn't mean anything. It's your caucus vote. So if you want to save America, then get everyone you know out to vote in the Nevada caucuses on Thursday, February 8th. And it's very important for you to help educate all of our supporters that we're not talking about the government-run universal mail-in ballots. We don't want mail-in ballots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't go on Tuesday, February 6th. That's two days earlier. Don't do it. Don't use a mail-in ballot. Don't do anything. It's a meaningless event. Totally. There are no delegates. It's a con job. We could have done it, but we we really want to do it the right way and the legitimate way. And so don't do the 6th, do the 8th.
do the caucus, not the primary. The primary is meaningless. I don't know, maybe they'll try and use it for uh, public relations purposes. Every time Trump supporters and they need something, they have to go. What you have to do is caucus on February 8th. It's the only it's the only way you can vote for President Trump. So caucus on February 8th. And if you need any details, February 8th. If you have any details or need anything, it's NV. Donald J. Trump. Did you ever hear of him? Dot com. Republican Governor Joe Lombardo, who is supporting Trump, told the Nevada Independent last month that he would vote for none of the above in Tuesday's primary and would caucus for Trump on Thursday. And that was the option that voters had in the primary. You could either vote for Nikki Haley. Uh, actually, I think there were a few other candidates uh, whose names were on the ballot, may- maybe even Senator Tim Scott, some of them who had uh, originally been in the race and could not get their name removed from the ballot. But the other option was none of the above. That's what the Trump campaign was encouraging supporters to do and hoping that they would embarrass Nikki Haley and that none of the above would win. I mean, that would be quite embarrassing to Haley, wouldn't it? If none of the above has more votes than she does. The Nevada Democrat Party accused the GOP counterpart of creating chaos by holding the caucuses in addition to their primary. But several Republican voters who were interviewed said that, uh, and this was at uh, at one of the polling stations at the uh, Desert Breeze Community Center, said they weren't confused at all. All three were Trump supporters, said they voted for none of the above. Two of the three say they will uh, attend Thursday's caucus, which uh, Trump is expected to be back in Las Vegas on Thursday for a caucus celebration. Uh, Nikki Haley is not returning to Nevada, we're told, this week and hasn't campaigned in the state since speaking in late October at the Republican Jewish Coalition's annual leadership conference. Uh, Her campaign manager said, in terms of Nevada, we have not spent a dime nor an ounce of energy in Nevada, so Nevada is not and has never been our focus. This week's contests are just an appetizer for Nevada, which is a key general election battleground state. We'll see plenty of campaign traffic this summer and later in the fall. 864-477-JOY, 864-477-5639. Your comments are welcome on the Furman Ford tax line. You think there's any chance that none of the above might win in Nevada? And what does that do to Nikki Haley's campaign? If she's not able to, if she didn't win more votes in the primary with her name being the, uh, the only, well, actually, again, I'm not sure. I think, I think there may have been a couple other, I need, I need to look that up. I'll report back to you on that <laughs> a little bit later. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre yesterday dodged a question on President Biden's mental and physical health after the president appeared to confuse French President Emmanuel Macron with former French President Francois Mitterrand, who has been dead for nearly 30 years. I'll get back to that in just a moment. Are you looking for a new vehicle? Or maybe you need to be able to trust a dealership, a locally owned dealership with a good pre-owned vehicle. Or maybe you just need some service on that existing vehicle, but you don't want to wait two, three weeks or, or, or longer. I have the solution for you, and it's Furman Ford in Lawrence. With all the, uh, the, the big corporations who are more powerful than ever, with new technologies like artificial intelligence changing the game, it's more important than ever to support businesses that are right here in our community, locally run businesses. And that's what you get when you go to Furman Ford. When it comes to getting your next vehicle, I choose Furman Ford at large. They do business the right way. Their name is on the sign because their name is on the line. That means when you stop in, you give them a call or you send them an email, you always have access to a member of the Furman family. They'll help you navigate the great deals they have on their great selection of pre-owned vehicles. And what's even better, when you drive your new vehicle off the lot, you know that your money is staying right here in our community to help support a locally owned community business. 
If you want a, a better all-around buying experience, visit my friends at Furman Ford and Lawrence. Find them online at FurmanFord.com, FurmanFord.com. The latest Biden gaffe came during a campaign stop in Las Vegas over this past weekend. The president was recalling a meeting he had with Macron at the G7 summit in England shortly after he assumed the White House in 2021. But instead of Macron, Biden dropped the name of Mitterrand, who was the president of France between 1981 and 1995, and he died in 1996. Fox News' Peter Ducey questioned how the president could convince large numbers of voters who were worried about his physical and mental health after making those comments. Jean-Pierre, looking visibly annoyed with Ducey, said, I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole with you, sir. And how is President Biden ever going to convince the three quarters of voters who are worried about his physical and mental health that he is okay, even though in Las Vegas he told a story about recently talking to a French president who died in 1996? I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole with you, what? sir. What is We're going to go. Hole? Go ahead. He said go he ahead. talked to Mitterrand. Go ahead. In you saw the president in Vegas, in California. You've seen the president in South Carolina. You saw him in Mich- Michigan. I'll just leave it there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, let's just move on. Don't don't worry about the fact that the president was uh, relaying <laughs> an interaction with the dead, with the dead man, who a guy who's been dead for thirty years. Don't worry about that. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Now, later in the press conference, another reporter asked Jean-Pierre to respond to criticisms that Joe Biden has given far fewer interviews during his presidency than any of his predecessors. The reporter noted that no press conference was scheduled during Biden's hosting of German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, nor was the president scheduled to give an interview during the Super Bowl. Porter said, it just seems again like we're in one of these instances where the president is not communicating with the press stay tuned that's the answer i have for you jean pierre said challenging the notion that joe biden was not engaging with the press the reporter pushed back though noting that biden has given less than half the number of interviews that his predecessors have given at this point in their presidency jean pierre said the president communicates in quote non-traditional ways which, you know, when she said that, it led me to start thinking, well, non-traditional, what, what does that mean? I mean, he's talking about having talked to a dead president of France. So does he, does he communicate like through seances maybe? Uh, maybe he has a Ouija board that he communicates with the dead. I mean, what could she potent, uh, uh, possibly mean by he communicates in non-traditional ways? I, I, I know I'm being, I'm, I'm kind of being sarcastic here talking about seances and a Ouija board, but I would love to know what she means by he communicates in non-traditional ways. Is, is it like sign language or something? As to why the president is not doing a Super Bowl interview, missing out on a massive audience in an election year, Jean-Pierre said people want to see the game. <laughs> they're not interested in Joe Biden, which he probably has a good point there, but that's not really the reason. The reason he's not doing the, the, this Super Bowl deal, which which is a big deal, is because they know he can't stand there and read a teleprompter. They know he'll fl- he'll he'll have another gaffe, or at least they're they're afraid of the fact or the idea, or giving him the chance of having another gaffe in front of an audience like that. John Pierre said the president will find many other ways to communicate with Americans, the millions of Americans out there, and we will find those ways to do it where we think the time is right, she said. Presidents have given pre-taped interviews with the networks broadcasting the NFL championship game for years now. This year, the game being broadcast by CBS, the practice became consistent starting during President Obama's first term though uh, former President Trump did skip an NBC interview in 2018. 2024 will be the second Super Bowl interview in a row that Joe Biden has declined. On the Furman Ford text line, Ace 
writes, Joey, I just read that President Trump was denied immunity by the FSC. I'm just not understanding how he is being criminalized for something he didn't do. His entire speech is online for anyone to watch. He never told anyone to enter the Capitol. The words he used was peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. That isn't in any way, shape, or form inciting a January 6th insurrection. How much proof do they need? Ace, they don't look for the truth. That's what we do here on Just the Truth. The uh, the, the, the federal government, the, the Biden administration, the Biden Department of Justice, they're not looking for the truth. They're not interested in the truth. Appreciate your comment, though. Texter says, Joey, if Trump has no immunity, then the minute, the, the minute Biden leaves office, we sue him for the open border leading to deaths and the parents of children who died from fentanyl file individual suits. Faye writes, live it over vote. Mayorkas is despicable. The damage he has done to this country, exclamation, exclamation. I'm seeing red. What is wrong with Republicans? Are they morons? Glad Rona McDaniel is possibly gone. Thank you, Faye. Texter writes on the Furman 4 text line, stop all illegal border crossings. Do not process anyone. Send them back to where they come from on their own country's dime. Or send them to the Ukraine and let that $60 billion take care of them there. This country is being run by idiots, and I cannot believe we don't have enough people working for the country to stop this insanity. The people are growing tired of these political games. Thank you for your comment. Dom in Illinois. Hey, good to hear from you, Dom. Says, Joey, oh, for goodness sake, the operative word in your entire report is illegal. This is uh, Dom's referencing yesterday's episode where we talked uh a lot about this uh this this what over a hundred billion dollar deal that the senate released on sunday supposedly uh gonna help the southern border when over half over 60 billion of that goes to ukraine not to our southern border dom says these people are in this country illegally all caps and should get absolutely nothing except an escort back across the border. If a bank robber robber is arrested, do we give them a ride anywhere in the country? Food, lodging, health care? Heck no, they get a jail cell. Or they used to be before Biden. That is exactly what should happen to the illegals, and we should be screaming that it does. Be well, Joey, even though you got my blood pumping this morning. Take your blood pressure there, Dom, and uh, a deep breath. (laughs) <laughs> Appreciate your comment. Susan on the Furman Ford text line. According to Breitbart, McConnell is jumping ship on Langford's increasingly unpopular border bill. He must be afraid of losing his leadership position. Uh, well, Ted Cruz and J.D. Vance and some of them, uh, they do have Mitch McConnell on point for sure. Jeff writes, I don't understand why we're sending so many billions of dollars to Ukraine and... And this was a very, uh, very uh, observant of Jeff. We didn't get a text of encouragement today, he said. You're right, Jeff. Our text of encouragement, we we missed out on that because the the, the person who typically sends a text of encouragement, this uh, anonymous person, and I'm very thankful for he or she, I didn't get one. And... Very observant of you to notice that. But I did get one today. So our text of encouragement today, God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. Good advice. God bless. 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Your comments are welcome on the Furman Ford text line. Hey, you can send a text of encouragement as well. Leave a voice message. Send me an email, joey at joeyhudson.com. In a move reflecting growing discontent with the way that South Carolina elects its judges, the state Senate is blocking all judicial elections, including that of the next state Supreme Court justice, short of the General Assembly passing a bill on judicial reform. I'm going to give you the full details on that in just a moment. Portions of the day show brought to you by Discounted Appliance Warehouse. Are you tired of buying appliances from the inexperienced sales staff who have 
absolutely no appliance knowledge, let me tell you about Discounted Appliance Warehouse in Pickens and the great service they they give. They have an award-winning service department, and I know firsthand they're going to be coming to my house on Friday. It was real simple. I noticed that a couple of lights in our refrigerator were not coming on. I text, uh, text Jeff real quick. Sent him. A, actually, took a picture of the refrigerator, showing that some of the side lights were on. The overhead lights were not. Sent it to him. They're coming out on Friday. Just that quick. That quick. Got a text confirmation telling me the time that they would be there. That's the kind of service you're going to get with Discounted Appliance Warehouse. When you go in and you're buying a new appliance, appliances are expensive. You can't afford to make the wrong decision. You're going to have the confidence knowing that the team at Discounted Appliance Warehouse they have the knowledge you need to make the right purchase. They'll show you around the warehouse over at 11,000 square feet packed with about 1500 new appliances ready for you by today. You can use it today. In most cases, they've got you covered well beyond the sale as I'm, I'm proving right now, discounted appliance warehouse. They're proud to offer speed queen. The only washer and dryers with up to seven year warranty on parts and labor. Find them online at D a W pickens.com D a W pickens.com. Judicial elections in South Carolina, it's, it's been, we knew it was going to be a hotbed this year. It's a key function of the South Carolina General Assembly. The House is expected to fulfill that function today. The Senate does not share that expectation and has instead demanded that the legislature first effectively address judicial reform before any judicial elections take place. State Senator Dick Harpulian, he's a Democrat, so this is not a partisan thing necessarily. He's a lawyer legislator and a proponent of judicial reform. He said a substantial number of senators believe we need to deal with judicial reform in an expedited fashion. That's not going to happen without some consequence, and the consequence is we're not going to have an election on judges until we have judicial reform legislation passed. Kudos to the state Senate on this. House members, mm, some may not uh, absolutely agree with this. Uh, The move should, for some, come as no surprise because State Senator Wes Clymer, he's from the uh, Rock Hill area, told the state last year, last fall, he said that he would filibuster judicial elections during this legislative session until the makeup of the state Judicial Merit Selection Commission changes, namely the removal of state representative Todd Rutherford. You remember him? We've talked about him a lot. Climber said last October, as long as there's a system that allows drug traffickers attorneys to pick our judges, we will not have judicial elections. He's referring to Todd Rutherford, who is a member of the Judicial Merit Selection Commission responsible for determining whether judges are qualified to serve. Rutherford is a Democrat. He's the minority leader of the House. He said the Senate's blockade will at least ensure that South Carolina Supreme Court Justice Don Beatty, who is black, remains on the bench amid a decline in diversity on the state's benches. Uh, 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 Rutherford said, again, referring to Clymer and Harpoolian, I applaud their actions. I think that they're doing a good job. That's the only way that we're ever going to get a black chief justice to remain in a judicial seat. Now, uh, Chief Justice Beatty is set to be, uh, his term is up. And was expected to leave that position. Uh, Justice John Kittredge is expected to to assume that position. If no elections are held this session, though, Beatty, who is uh, is retiring this summer, would remain in office until his successor is named. Uh, yesterday, Senator Clymer confirmed that judicial elections are on hold; they will not be taking place. Clymer said. We won't hold judicial elections until we pass something on judicial reform, adding that he and 20 other senators introduced a Senate resolution that would permit Kittredge's election despite all others. That resolution, however, was not taken up by the Senate uh, before today. In South Carolina, candidates for judicial office must apply to the JMSC. Following a review of the candidate's background, the commission forwards a report to the General Assembly detailing whether the candidate is fit to serve. 
The full legislature then picks a candidate among those deemed qualified. In the case of magistrates and masters in equity, legislators decide which candidate they'll recommend to Governor Henry McMaster uh, or whoever is the governor for appointment. There have been ongoing concerns raised about the transparency and perception of trustworthiness of the judiciary. One particular concern is about what level of influence lawyer legislators hold over the screening of judges. And we saw this with Representative Todd Rutherford, who made some sweetheart deals this past year. This, this is why it really came to light. This has been brewing. It's been simmering. But it, it boiled over when Todd Rutherford had a couple of sweetheart deals with judges this past year. Remember the retiring judge who released the criminal 19 years early? This judge retired a few weeks later after he he, he uh, had this deal with Todd Rutherford. That's why you don't need people like Todd Rutherford, a lawyer legislator, on the Judicial Merit Selection Panel. Senator Harpoolian, again, a Democrat, has proposed a bill that, among other things, would disqualify a legislator's close relative from seeking a judgeship said that the problem with judicial selection in South Carolina is the public's perception of a small number of people improperly wielding significant influence over the way judges are selected. Uh, Senator, I applaud your efforts. It's not a perception issue. It's the truth. We're not talking about perception here. And again, we deal with just the truth here on just the truth. It is true that Some of these lawyer legislators have too much influence over who is on the bench, and then they practice in front of them. Harpoolian said the problem is the public is losing faith in our judicial system because of the shenanigans by a very small number of lawyer legislators in the process of picking judges and then using their leverage or influence to get deals, if you will, from judges they should not get. Again, he's not saying Todd Rutherford. I'll say it for him. Todd Rutherford is the poster child of why you can't trust our judicial election system. Todd Rutherford uses his influence to get some of these judges elected so that he can practice in front of them and get these sweetheart deals. And it's wrong. And, And I applaud the Democrats and the Republicans in the state Senate for holding this up. I, I, I saw where Senator Josh Kimbrell was one of those. Maybe we need to have Senator Kimbrell on just the truth here and uh, talk with us about uh, judicial reform. That's it for today's edition of Just the Truth. Thanks for joining me in the PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition Studio to lose weight for the last time. Visit myphdweightloss.com. If you haven't joined our mailing list, Visit my website, joeyhudson.com. Click on the Connect with Joey button so that you can receive our emails with the most up-to-date news. Also, find me on YouTube. Just search Joey Hudson when you're on YouTube. Send me a quick text uh, text on the Furman Ford text line. I'll send you a link if you can't find it. Thanks for spending a few minutes of your day with me. I always appreciate it. I know that you have options in what you do with your time every day. I appreciate you spending it with me here on Just the Truth. And let me encourage you to forward today's edition to a friend or a family member. That's how we build our community is we tell other people about what we do. So let me ask you, if each one of you will forward this to a friend and ask them to subscribe, to follow Just the Truth, we'll grow our our audience here. We'll grow our community. And I'm glad that you're part of that. Keep those comments coming on the Furman Ford text line, 864-477-5639. You can leave me a quick voice message as well. Emails are always welcome, joey at joeyhudson.com. Until next time, and we're back tomorrow. Remember, God's got this. He's still in control.